I look at what's happening in North Korea, what's happening in Washington. Can you just begin by giving us an overall sense of the situation? Well, as you know very well, U.S. policy toward North Korea over the past quarter century has not been a spectacular success. And I think the reasons are more attitudinal than institutional, although you could say attitude shape policy. Even going back to the Korean War, the United States assumed that North Korea was following the orders of bigger powers, that Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, was a puppet, Stalin's puppet. In fact, a high-ranking official in the State Department said of the relationship between Stalin and Kim Il-sung as exactly the same as that between Walt Disney and Donald Duck. And by that miscalculation, the United States committed itself to defend South Korea because the U.S. saw the North Korean invasion as a prelude to a global communist campaign of aggression, so some kind of stance had to be taken. I think that kind of continuing patronizing view of North Korea, if we are a bit more civil, give them some money, maybe they'll listen to us and give up their nukes, that's been at the core of the failure of U.S. policy for the past 25 years. Now, if appeasement or placating the enemy works, fine, I say. But I think the problem has been growing. North Korea's lethality is growing, and North Korea today stands on the cusp of holding the U.S. hostage to its nuclear blackmail. So this is a very, very serious situation. I don't think we can live with a nuclear North Korea the way we have with respect to China or Russia or other powers because North Korea is a fundamentally revisionist state that needs to cope with a far more attractive, legitimate, successful state across the border. So they need to increase their menacing capabilities, and they will. Mm. Yeah, I always think of it in terms of the uh, technology here as two streams of threat that are moving toward each other. One is nuclear weapons, including miniaturizing and hardening, and the other is the ability to deliver them with intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I would say those streams, if they haven't crossed, they're about to. And it's like in Ghostbusters, you just don't want the streams to cross. Let's put another factor on the table in our conversation, which is Donald Trump. How has the president's rhetoric helped, hurt, not really mattered in this situation? The president's strong rhetoric has done wonders for North Korea because every time the U.S. president threatens to totally destroy North Korea, makes disparaging remarks about the adversary, the young North Korean dictator, basically you are giving North Korea a free pass to do the next provocation, provocation they would have done anyway mm -hmm. and blame the United States. And North Korea is very good at smokescreen, diversionary tactics. So when the North Korean foreign minister in New York in September made a threat, two threats mm -hmm. with specificity, now we have the right to shoot down a U.S. plane outside our airspace and we have the right to conduct a hydrogen bomb test over the Pacific. Of those two specific threats, I think, I think the shoot down of the U.S. plane, which would in inflict the loss of lives on U.S. servicemen, would be viewed as the bigger threat that may lead to some kind of military response. Mm. So they won't go there. Mm. It's a ruse in my view. Mm. And when they do the hydrogen bomb test, showing the world that they have that capability, nukes and delivery system over the Pacific, as grave a provocation as that would be, much of the rest of the world, they'll be in a collective sigh of relief. Oh, at least we averted war. At least no American lives were lost. Mm -hmm. At least there's not going to be a military response. Mm -hmm. And North Korea would essentially get a free pass. So continuing to threaten, disparage the North Korean regime, if it worked, if it deterred them, I say go out, go all out, go crazy, call him the nastiest names you can. But not only does it not work, it gives North Korea a free pass to do the next provocation. Well, let's bring the dynasty of North Korea into the conversation. You've studied the history of this family. This is now the third generation of an effectively a Stalinist style of leadership. Um, we haven't seen that in modern times. Um, the young leader is still young. He is untested, untried. Um, how do you assess him and his leadership and the implications of this third generation aspect of the leadership in North Korea? 
From a humanitarian perspective, the past seven decades under the Kim dynasty in terms of the repression of basic freedoms, freedom of speech, assembly, religion, internal, external movement, the right to eat, and so on. One could argue, I would argue, that these basic freedoms have been more egregiously repressed under the Kim dynasty than during the Japanese colonial era, when Japan colonized Korea, 1910 to 1945, which was a brutal occupation, um, really just conditions were very, very brutal. So it was a life of deprivation and humiliation for the Korean people. But North Koreans today, North Koreans on average today, are shorter than people living in the Korean peninsula at any time since the dawn of the 20th century. In terms of security implications, it's grave because we tend to laugh at North Korea. There's such a mix of a strange amalgamation of the weird, the medieval, the absurd, the crazy, but they have to survive. They have to keep up with the Kims and the Lees across the border. You have an affluent, prosperous, very pleasant, successful Korean state. And you know, they say all politics is local. I don't think geopolitics is all geopolitical, international, I think it starts with the local dynamics. So that is the basic fundamental existential threat that the regime has to deal with, and that means they cannot freely open their doors to the outside world. They can't allow their people the basic freedoms. So the kind of internal repression, extreme repression, and external threat will go on, and they will become a more menacing power, bullying the region, South Korea and Japan, and the United States. Mm. Agreed, and we've discussed it before, but a book I often recommend is actually a novel, The Orphan Master's Son by Adam Johnson, which is a fictionalized look into that very dystopian society. There are also very moving accounts, as you well know, of defectors and escapees from that regime. I take your point entirely. Well, what's the end game for North Korea? What, what is the objective? in your mind for the young leader? Does he truly believe he will one day rule the Korean peninsula? Or does he have more limited aims? Well, for now, as unbalanced the economic power of the respective Korean states are, in fact, nowhere in the world do you see such a huge income disparity between two neighboring states as in the Korean peninsula. But that's an irreversible trend. Right now, economists estimate South Korea is 40 times richer than the North. It's probably much more than that. So what do you do? Well, even despite that gloomy reality of being the poor, backward Korean state, the Kim regime does enjoy certain advantages. Mm -hmm. The regime is, for example, able to enforce censorship on South Korean government and public at large whenever NGOs, human rights activists, criticize North Korea for egregious human rights violations, North Korea says, we're going to bomb you. We're going to start a war. This is a declaration of war. We will kill you. And that false equation of the exercise of free speech in the South against North Korea means the right to shoot back and kill. That false equation has become sort of, you know, and accepted, the accepted wisdom. Mm -hmm. South Koreans exercise self-censorship. Mm -hmm. So even now, North Korea is able to bully and extort the South. And once they have nuclear weapons with which they can freely nuke major US cities, that ability to emasculate South Korea, to isolate it, and perhaps one day prevail over it, you know, that will become mm -hmm. almost a reality. So Kim Jong-un needs to prevail over South Korea. If the United States, however, was to abandon South Korea, to downgrade its support for South Korea, perhaps even abrogate the alliance, mm. would that secure U.S. security? Would that lead to more security for the United States? Perhaps, but then again, perhaps not. Because North Korea, I don't think, will be content with that. North Korea will continue to menace the United States and ask for more, get the U.S. troops out of Japan, for example. Yeah, I find it. Um, extremely unlikely that the United States would walk away from this alliance. Um, it's a cornerstone of U.S. Pacific policy, and I think will continue to be so. Well, let's wrap this up by asking you to f tell us, how does it end? 
what's going to happen? And I'll ask you to do it as follows. Um, what do you think the percentage chance is that we end up in a significant all-out war on the Korean Peninsula? Is it 1%, 5%, 10%, even higher? And what do you think are the chances that we manage to maintain an approach that constrains North Korea without ending up in that full-blown war? I don't know what the percentage right now may be, but it's there. It's not a negative <laughs> uh, digit. How will it all end? Well, things will have to get a lot worse before they get better, before there is any kind of resolution. In the meantime, I think the U.S. government is now resolved to enforce sanctions. We know that sanctions against North Korea have been far weaker than U.S. sanctions against many other countries in the past, which is quite puzzling. So there is finally the political will to enforce sanctions, but of course, sanctions enforcement, like domestic law enforcement, takes a lot of time and effort. In the meantime, North Korea will provoke. North Korea will try carrot and stick, perhaps make a dramatic gesture of peace, send athletes to the Winter Olympiad. North Korea will call for talks as it issues threats. And at that point, there is always the temptation for any U.S. government to settle for an expedient deal, a temporary freeze, kind of a deal and go back to negotiations and give North Korea various concessions. Relaxing sanctions prematurely have not worked in our interest. I think the U.S. government needs to really galvanize the international community to do their part to enforce sanctions. And to what end? Well, better leverage, stronger leverage vis-a-vis -vis North Korea on a host of issues, of course. But at the same time, unless we are able to choke off Kim's streams of revenue to the point that his ability to placate the men with access to big guns are increasingly diminished unless Kim is presented with the specter of imminent regime collapse, rebellion and so forth. He will never come to see the options before him which will be reform, open my doors, give up my nukes, which he will not want to, never going to happen. or abdicate, never going to happen. or live out the rest of his life in posh exile in Macau, perhaps. Probably not going to happen. Seems or unlikely. live out the rest of his life in constant fear of political extinction. Unless we are able to credibly threaten him financially, there won't be any resolution to this issue. Well, I'll put you down as pessimistic. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will convince the international community to avoid that all-out war. And I agree completely that the answer is increasing, unrelenting, crushing sanctions. To do that, we have to have China on board. In the end, all roads to Pyongyang lead through Beijing. More to follow. Thanks for spending time with us today.